All right. Uh, let's jump right in. So again, thank you everyone for joining us today. We appreciate you taking the time and putting some emphasis and focus into your enablement strategy specific to our topic for today of navigating sales enablement in the post-COVID world. But before we start, I just want to take a few minutes and acknowledge the acts of racial inequality and systematic injustice <clears throat> that's playing out in our country today. We at WorkRamp are committed to stand together with the Black community and are demonstrating support through various internal and external programs. You can check out our LinkedIn page for more information, and we are really committed to working with every one of our customers and make sure that we're getting through this together and putting our emphasis in the right places. So that being said, uh, let's jump into our topic for today. You get the pleasure, I'll let you decide if it's a pleasure or not, of first hearing from myself, Jen Scopo, I am with WorkRamp. I am part of our instructional design team, which means I work really closely with our clients on making sure that their content is built out really robustly, getting the most out of WorkRamp, and just helping them think through the training filter and really tapping into my expertise in training overall. I have the pleasure of being joined today by Roz, who's the Chief Enablement Officer at Level 213. She is the Bay Area's, well, and Level 213 is the Bay Area's top sales enablement consultancy firm that works with clients like Guru, Dr. Chrono, I'm going to go with, and Iterable. She spent over 10 years in developing training sales teams at top, top, guys, I'm a speaker for a living. I swear I know how to speak in English is my first language. We're going to get through this together. <laughs> Let's try that again. Um, developing and training sales teams at top tech companies like Optimizely and Oracle. So Roz, I'll pass it over to you for a second to uh, do a quick introduction of yourself. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here, Jen. And it's been it's been a tough time. So if you're tripping over words, we all understand that and we all get that. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I echo your sentiments that you started with. Um, and I think even thinking about it from an enablement firm perspective, I think it puts a tremendous onus on those of us in enablement to also be thinking about um, our employees and how they're, you know, um, impacted by everything that's going on today, especially in the, in the past week. And I, and I hope that we're all thinking about that. So thank you for having me and thank you for the introduction and thank you all for joining us. And, you know, um, you know, people ask us about the name of our company, Level 213, and, and, and I think it, it fits our, our topic here today. It's, you know, we're, we're, change happens at 212 and we need change now so badly in so many areas of our lives and we don't rest on our loyalty, so we go to 213. And so I'm hoping that that's, if you take nothing else out of today, that we as our people that we're change agents and we can help our, our organizations and our world hopefully change for the better um, over the next uh, this post COVID-19 and everything else world that we're in. Absolutely. I love that. And I was so glad I asked about your company name because that is such an amazing story and pivot point that really demonstrates how you were looking to level up and really take that approach. So today we are going to jump in exactly like you said, into navigating sales enablement in the post COVID world. We're going to cover a couple of topics, starting with the new state of sales enablement, rebuilding the onboarding strategy and how businesses can really stay nimble and competitive with ongoing training. So let's jump right into our first topic of the new state of sales enablement. We're going to cover a few things such as the impact of layoffs, adjusting to remote selling, and the new norm, everyone's new favorite expression, when it does come to time to return to work. So let's jump into that first topic. So Roz, I'm going to pass this over to you of from your perspective, how are the layoffs really impacting what we do in a sales enablement environment? Yeah, I think, you know, the impact of, you know, I want to start by saying that I think sales enablement became even more critical in this post COVID-19 world because A, there are layoffs and we're, we're working on a, uh, with a, a more streamlined workforce. And so every single person in this workforce becomes even more important. Companies aren't laying people off because they didn't need those roles or laying people off because they need to be able to maximize right. revenue, right? So, so, and it's even more critical now to keep the business running, to keep 
uh, revenue coming in to keep messaging going out correctly, and yet we have to do it with with less people. So I think you know enablement becomes so so incredibly critical to be thinking about how are we still still going to be enabling this workforce and doing it with less, and also managing all the change that's happening and the dynamic the, the dynamism if that's a word of everything that's happening in our world. You know, we talk about the new normal, and it's a new normal for Thursday at 10 a.m. in Pacific time. What's going to be at 12, right? Which is very right. scary, but so I, I want you know everybody who's on here as an enablement to realize like you are so critical and the technology you're using is so critical and what you're what you're offering your, the world is so critical and you're doing it probably with less partnership with le with right. less resources and having to maximize you know if somebody laid off you know their their sales workforce the salespeople that you kept have to be even more productive today Absolutely. so you become even more important so I think those are things that we should all be thinking about. Um, all the functionalities of the organization still need to, to exist, <laughs> but we're doing it with less people. And, and, um, and there's also, you know, morale that's, that's involved in this. Your friends are no longer here and, and the morale of everything that's going on around us. So I think sales enablement has a tremendous responsibility right now to step up and, and, and help the company through this critical time and help the people that are out there through a critical time and really learn how to partner with the right people and the right functions to make the biggest impact. Absolutely. That's exactly where my mind's been is that when there's a strain on resources training, right? We tend to be one of the first things that drops off the radar because you have to worry about productivity and moving forward. And for me, I totally see your perspective that this is the time where everyone needs more training. They need to be more connected and really having a grasp on what does my role look like now? And especially for those who are taking on extra responsibilities that aren't typically theirs because the workforce has such restraints, they yeah. need that extra training. You yeah. can't expect to maintain any level of productivity if they don't have the information, the resources they need. It's only going to take that much longer. So absolutely, enablement definitely needs to be at the forefront there. So keeping these things in mind, obviously, like we've said, with the strain on resources, what are some ways that we can really overcome these challenges? Yeah, you know, and I think about even to tie it back to, to what we were just saying, it's, it's, it's not necessarily that we need more training, it's that we need to be more on point, right? Everything right. needs to be just so targeted. And so, you know, and then you take on that you have the strain. And I think you have to work with your your business partners, because enablement is, very, in my opinion, is, is, you know, we're liaisons. And I don't want to make it sound like we're just, you know, you know, admins, because we're not at all, but we're, we're <laughs> right. bridging the gap between, often between product marketing and between product, between, you know, go to market. And so we're leveraging, we have a lot of partners that we have to work with, but those partners are, are, are hurting right now because they also have all these changes going on. So I think the more we can do to make sure that we're giving them the guidance of what we need and, and putting on the sales enablement hat and saying, this is what the go-to-market team, their sales team, the customer success team, whoever I'm enabling these, and, and be very clear as to why. So for example, you know, I'm thinking about um, a client that I work with that um, is launching a new product and is needing the messaging out really, really quickly and is relying on the product marketing team to help them. And the product marketing team is saying like, we have to update messaging. We, we're working with less people. So being able to say, this is how it ties back to our company OKRs. This is how it ties back to our company priorities. And we need your help to get there and make it really easy for them to work with you uh, by, by streamlining it to them, by templatizing it to them so that they can easily do it without having to feel this extra strain and it actually gives them almost a peace of mind. And also they want to be a part of it, right? They want to make sure the company right. supplies. They want to make sure the product gets sold out there. Um, the, the market really knows about it. So really being able to um, explain why it's important and make it easy for them to partner with you will, will make it so that you can not only put out what the field needs or what the salespeople need and the go-to-market team needs, but have it so on point that everybody wins from it. Absolutely. That's a great point. And when we were chatting last week and thinking about this discussion, you had even brought up a few concepts in terms of helping them do it even more effectively, right? Because for us, this is the world that we live in. But when yeah. you're looking for others in your organization to take part in that and you need their expertise, that some of the easiest things we can do are create some templates for them, give that really prescribed, here's the type of information we need, here's how we're going to build that to make it that much more simplistic on their end as well. So, yeah, and I actually had an yeah, experience 
just just recently where uh, you know a client of mine was we were working with a subject matter expert and subject matter experts are tricky because they're subject <laughs> matter experts and they know too much about the topic that right. they know about exactly. which is why they're the subject matter <laughs> expert right which is why we go to them and and they feel this overwhelm because they think i have all this information in my head i have to share all this information with the salespeople. and what they don't realize is no the salespeople need this sliver of the information and that's where we come in and it was interesting because i was this this person had literally wrote the book on the topic that we were training on and and this book was like a 300 page book and we were like we need it you know this portion of it this and half of the chapter was, yeah this chapter <laughs> and, he, and it was almost like you saw the sigh of relief come over him and he was just like oh okay this is so easy right right and, and he became such a great partner and because he knew how to operate mm -hmm. and and i think that becomes our responsibility to do and and leverage the best of of, of their expertise with the with the needs of of our organizations yeah, I love that you went there because one of my catchphrases that anyone who collaborates with me hears me say all the time that subject matter experts tell and trainers teach. Yeah. So it's really helping them exactly like you said, figure out what of this content do I need to drill down to and then we can take it and help them teach it. So your team is executing and exactly not inundated with all these extra details. So it definitely takes a lot of that stress off of them. Yeah, and make it easy for them, right? Like one of the reasons why I, I love Workaround, for example, is it's it's so easy for anyone to to learn and use and give them that template, give them what exactly what you need, and have them just be able to go fill it in. It saves you time because you're running on on very unlikely. And Absolutely. First of all, you probably have way more initiatives than you ever had on your plate. There's a tremendous amount of change that you have to you have to uh, adapt to, and you you don't have as many business partners. So use your resources, use your technology. Use the things that you do have to to make it really easy and to and almost like not to not to dumb it down, but you know, paint by number for your subject matter expert. And <laughs> That's your a great way of putting it. To work with you, right? <laughs> yep. So you've touched on a few things here in terms of really the main thing that came to mind for me was focusing and drilling down to what's most relevant, especially right now in this moment of maximizing that time, maximizing those resources. So, what are some things that we can do to help prevent? that information overload. And then one of our audience members had asked before even jumping in today, of kind of along that vein of preventing that information overload and keeping them engaged when we are all suffering from a little, you know, video fatigue and computer fatigue. So what are some things that we can do to really keep them engaged that way? Yeah, so I think it's two, it's two really good questions. The first one is, um, the information overload, I think we have to be very thoughtful about why does a salesperson need to know this and what do they have to be able to mm -hmm. do with the information? And if they don't need, if, if it's just a nice to have, then put it in, a, in some sort of a, of a knowledge management resource that, that they can go to on their own, but keep the, what they need to know. And that might change from day to day, right? Life is, is, been, is so dynamic right now, Absolutely. but really be very thoughtful of, do they need this? And this, this is going to help them. And what I'm hearing from salespeople today is just, just let me sell. Selling today is hard. It's so hard. It's always hard. It's even harder today. And so keep that in mind and also keep in mind everything else that's going on in their lives, right? Or do they have a five-year-old, you know, an eight-year-old they're trying to teach math to at the right. same time, right? So um, be very thoughtful of what do they need and what are they going to do with this information and give it to them in the way that they're going to be able to do it. And then, you know, you know, with the, with the fatigue, flip the classroom is the way there's is, is the concept when you think about it. it's like it, you don't have to use the video to do the training you can give them pre-work and then have the the, the, the the call be the conversation right have um allow them to come present on something sales people love to present right so if you see somebody being successful on something and there's something you want to teach to everybody mm -hmm. else partner with them so it makes it more interesting be creative in the ways that you're engaging with the, with the team and don't just do an information dump on them whether in, in any in any form that you do it think about how are they going to use it and how can i how can they apply it today to the, the deals that they have the um the the work that they have to be doing and if they don't need if it's a nice to have give it to them as an option if it's a need to have. Um, and lastly, I'll say design an alliance with them that it's going to change rapidly. You know, it's overwhelming and right. you know, it's going to change. And what you're going to promise them is that you'll always keep them up to date. And what they're going to promise you is they'll, they'll participate by, by understanding that change is the only constant we have right now and that they'll, they'll check for updates on a daily or whatever. And it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be perfect on our end. I know I'm a, I'm a perfectionist. I like my enablement to be perfect. Um, and I look at, um, you know, the, the late night TV shows today, 
Jimmy Fallon's show, his kid pops up in the middle of the show and he goes with it, right? Because, and we're all okay with it because he designed right. an alliance with us and it doesn't have to be perfect. And, that, and, and yet we enjoy the entertainment. I think the salespeople feel the same way. Like uh, we're, we appreciate or they're gonna be appreciative that you are being real with them, being honest with them and keeping them up to date and not overwhelming them. And, and they'll be okay if it's, if it's, at, if it's a little bit more ad hoc than normal. I love that. Kind of like establishing those rules of engagement. So yeah. everyone knows what's expected of them, what they can expect in return, and then really focusing on, I like to call it their ROE, their return on effort, yes. right? For a sales team, their time is always their money, but especially right okay. now. So yeah. why am I doing this? Why do I care? What am I actually going to get out of this time that's going to help me on the back end of it? Yeah, absolutely. I love that approach there. So then thinking about as we move into this post-COVID world, what are some of those key things that we can do to ease that return to work? Yeah, um, you know, it's interesting because I think there's gonna be so many hybrids of what that return to work actually Absolutely. looks like, right? And, and it's gonna be maybe even a slow roll. And so I think, A, we need to realize that when we're thinking about an A moment, be very thoughtful that you may do it live, you may do it virtual, you may do a mix of both, right? And so you should be thinking or, or, uh, about how do I design this in a way that works for all audiences in, in, in different kinds of settings? And can I pivot as quickly as possible? And you know, I, I had a situation where right when, when the pandemic was starting, when we were starting to realize it wasn't just the flu, or at least I was starting to realize it wasn't just the flu, <laughs> um, we were planning a, a live event for a client and we had designed it as a completely in-person event. And the day before we found out that they weren't going to be flying and they weren't going to be coming in and we right. had to switch it. And it didn't translate, honestly, as good as it should have. And so I think right now, the lesson that we have to learn is we should be thinking, you know, not even plan A, plan B, plan C, but we can be faced with so many different things and it may change the morning up, right? So how am I going to design this in a way that it will be engaging and, and it will still do what the salesperson needs it to do or the go-to-market person needs it to do in any circumstance that I might, that I might, be, that I might need to present it? Um, and then short, 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 short micro learning. Um, less is more and more engagement and more applying to the reality of their jobs today. Let them be able to take whatever you're doing and, and, and don't make up a flake role play if you can. Use a real life story, a real customer call, for example. Right. Let them upload a, a, a real <clears throat> customer call. Let them really use, um, the, the, because it, then they're selling, but they're, they're also learning, right? right? And I think the other thing I'm thinking about is build things that you can pivot really easily. So build the infrastructure in a way that if it does change within 24 hours, you don't have to rebuild, start, you know, scrap everything mm -hmm. you had and, and start it from scratch. You can maybe go in and I, I think about when, you know, um, you know, carpet today used to come back in the day, it's like one big piece and now it comes in, in, in sections, right? right? So that you can move that section if someone spills white, red wine or something, <laughs> right? So be able to just go in and change one thing. So short, chunked up, apply to real life um, and use the time live with people, whether in person or remote, um, as, as, as a time to kind of community of practice. And then also let them know, you know, going back to, you know, the return to work that we'll keep you updated. We know things are going to change and we'll keep you updated on rules of engagement and we'll tell you where to find out uh, what the reality is for today so that you can uh, know how to do your day job and sell and drive yeah. revenue for that company. Absolutely. So really being ready to kind of pivot in that moment, which was actually a question that popped up in the chat box also was how do you prepare to do that? And it sounds like a lot of what you're saying is to really just kind of have that in mind to begin with, which frankly is a good practice ongoing. You should yeah. always be thinking about how would I do this live? How would I do it remotely? And even if you don't need to do it remotely and you're able to do it live when you want to, you can replicate that later. You can still have it available. And if you're coming from that perspective from the beginning, you're that much more prepared because we have no idea what these next couple of weeks or months are going to look like. So Hopefully um, for our audience member who dropped that question and that gives you a little bit more insight there. And if it doesn't, please drop a clarifying question and we'd be happy to revisit that a little bit. Um, when we were chatting last week, we were talking about that communication, about that transparency. What are some strategies that you think could be put into place to really have that kind of clear channel of communication and where are they getting this information from? 
Yeah, so I think the first thing to think about is that you're, you know, let's not forget that we are doing this enablement for human beings. And one of the things that I have gotten into the, into the practice of doing when I design anything is I try to have a, a, a LinkedIn profile of, of somebody who's going to be in the audience, of the audience of the person who's going to, of the team that's going to be um, um, engaging with this resource. And so thinking about the reality of the, the, all the uncertainty in their lives, and don't forget that there are humans there, and, and Absolutely. A, ask them what they need, ask them the questions that they have, um, and then also, and, and, and be very mindful that you're doing this for human beings, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then re I think w what we're going to see, uh, I'm assuming, or, or, or signs are showing that we may have Sil more silo teams than normal. Like companies may say, you know, the AEs come in on Monday and the SDRs come in on Tuesday. And then the problem with that is, or the challenge around that is, you're not able to, you know, have easy handovers from, from right. one role to the other. So really try to be thoughtful about how and give them the rules of engagement or suggestions of ways or find best practices that are working within the teams that are working real to, really to, well together as account teams and, 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 and be the conduit for that, for that bridge, you know, from the, from the different right. interruptions that happen throughout. Um, and then use your knowledge management, use your learning management, use the tools that you have to give them the information that they need, that they know where to find it. And, and, and most importantly, they should know it's up to date because it, it date stamp everything and mm -hmm. let them know that if it changes, unless you, it, the latest, we will always have the latest information up for, you, up for you so that they can with confidence know that they're, re, that they're acting in accordance with what they should be, um, what should, they should be doing at that time. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that you took it from the human approach that all too often people miss the step of asking your team what they need, what's going to be helpful, that we kind of get in the mindset of we already know and we have a prescribed answer and really setting the expectation that we're kind of wiping the slate clean here. No one's judging you on a question you ask or a protocol you're unclear on because we need to make sure we're on the same page. I know I have a couple of clients that I've been building content with that to get a little work ramp specific for a minute are using the libraries and they're yeah. using that as a way to, they're creating an individual resource just attaching a file of a PDF of their most updated um, newsletter or something like that. And if you also have it integrated into Slack, you can easily roll that out to your team. So everyone's getting that quick update and knowing, okay, there's something new to check and it just kind of makes this new channel of communication really natural. Yeah. And I think Slack is, I love that you brought up Slack. Slack look at the questions that are coming through Slack. Look at the conversations going on yeah. in Slack. That's how you really hear it because you may be in a, in a world where you have some people on site, some people off site, some people, some companies are going to stay off site for a very long time. Some, some, you know, it may be the individual human doesn't feel comfortable coming back, although everybody else comes back. So there could be one right. team member that doesn't come back. Maybe they're pregnant or something. Right. Um, and so really listen to that. I would also look at the, the, the trainings that, that you have out there that people are going to and, 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 and on their own voluntarily, that's going to give you a cue of, of some, some things that they may, they, they may need reinforced. One of my clients, as you gave the example of working with your clients, one of my clients is doing today in marketing where they have a product marketing team every day gives an update of t this is today's update and the sales team knows that that's going to come out so that they know that every day there's something new coming out. For exactly. That, right. So you may have today in sales today and, you know, in enablement today in marketing so that they know, and it's brief, right. And keep everything brief always, <laughs> but more important than ever. Um, but let them know it's, it's, it's as current as today. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, so this, these are great strategies of communication for our current teams. There are some companies that are actually still bringing on new employees in this environment and are having to bring someone on from the beginning and get them onboarded, right? Get them into your culture, get them into their role without interacting with the human directly for who knows how long. So let's switch gears into that a little bit of how do we adjust that onboarding strategy in this post-COVID environment? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think, first of all, you, it, I think it behooves all of us to look at what is in the onboarding and make sure it's still accurate, right? You want to make sure that you're giving the most updated information. Sure. And if some, and, and, and you know, if you haven't been doing onboarding for the past few months, um, or even if you have, things likely have probably changed in the past few months. It could be your messaging has completely changed. It could be the ROEs have completely changed. Um, and so make sure that what you're, what you're producing is, what you're giving out to the new employees is, is really the most up to date. Um, and also you likely were doing a boot camp, or you likely were doing in person and, and be thoughtful about how can you take what you're wanting the new hire to go through and make it consumable 
because if we talk about the fatigue of Zoom for somebody who's been with the company for a while and is ready to be comfortable, let's multiply that by 10x for somebody who's right. brand new, right? Who doesn't even know who to ask questions to. Um, so be thoughtful about that. Look at your learning path and try to see what is, you know, what's, what is everything still accurate? And if not, what can we change? Um, number two, I think, think about one of the big things in, in, in onboarding, it's not just about what they're learning, it's about learning the culture and it's about getting mm -hmm. comfortable where you are. So what can you do to foster that that pride and that excitement of being in your company and really understanding it. Um, and it goes back to that human connection, right? <laughs> so, you know, how can you give this employee, maybe give them one-on-one -on -one time with uh, phone conversations with no agenda or a specific agenda with some of the key stakeholders that they have to have, um, give the, make sure that the team that they're joining is reaching out to them because likely in normal times, they would have had lunch with them or they would have had a happy right. hour. You can't do that today. I mean, you could, you know, do a virtual one, but it's not the same thing. <laughs> So make sure that they're getting a sense of the culture. Um, if you're, you're, if you're a, a culture that has, that, that, that's fun, make sure that they get a sense of that as well. Um, and, and, you know, I think about when I was at Optimizely and we went from, we were all inside organization and we started introducing an outside organization. And there are different challenges for an outside organization for the people that are on, in the field because A, they don't, they don't know what they don't know and they don't know who to ask what they don't know. <laughs> of right? course. And, um, and they don't, and I think salespeople in particular are, who are hired for their expertise and for how good they are at what they know, they, they don't want to ask a question and seem like they don't know it. Right. And so, and I really struggled with this at first of like, how do I support this group, these, this, these group of people? And what I ended up doing is creating a Slack channel just for them and for our field team. And I told them like, any questions that you have, put them in here. And even if you answer it for each other, what it did for me is it let me know what were the questions that they had, what resources did I have to create for them? What are things that I took for granted that they would know? And it became the, um, the, the, the structure that I used to be able to uh, enable this remote workforce. And I think today, if your entire team is remote or if your partial of the team is remote, you have to really keep your eye on that. And mm -hmm. then it, it, and, and very often it became things that everybody needed. Right. And I think even, uh, and think about that too, right? If you're mm -hmm. if if you're rechanging your entire onboarding, likely you have to retrain everybody else. And did you do that? Yeah, there's some gaps to fill. Yeah, and what happens? You know, what happened in my case with that field um, Q and A is slowly it stopped um, being as active. Not because they stopped needing it, but because we fulfilled what they needed. So listen and 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 make it safe for them to ask questions and make sure that um, and make like make sure the new hire knows. We know that these are difficult times. We know that you're not going through a regular onboarding and, and we're here for you to support you on that and make sure they get to know the people um, that, they're, that they're going to be working with on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, absolutely. You made a bunch of great points in there that I don't want to get lost in translation because my brain's reeling with ideas and I'm not even the one who's going to go out there and start implementing this in this moment. So a couple of things that you touched on was really, first of all, making sure that your content is accurate, you're making adjustments as you go, filling those gaps for your existing team, and then kind of doubling back a little bit to what we chatted about, but in terms of specifically to onboarding, making sure that your materials are ready to go online, that they work online. And if you're not hiring, now is still a good moment to start thinking about that. Maybe not put your resources there right now, but start mapping it out and thinking as you are creating something for your team right now, do you also need this in onboarding that you can spend an extra 15 minutes, make a couple of tweaks. So it's also ready to go for that piece. So you don't get caught in the moment of not being prepared and then not helping that new person really get into the organization as effectively as they need to in the beginning. And I think, you know, onboarding is an interesting one because right now a lot of companies aren't hiring, but I think all of a sudden it's going to be, okay, go. And we exactly. need 15 salespeople by tomorrow, they all have to be enabled. And what are we going to do with that? <laughs> right? And so, and I think that's going to come sooner than later at this point. Absolutely. Because I'm a huge proponent that you begin engaging your employees and keeping them as a long-term employee from the moment they start, from that very first day, you're yeah. already working on keeping them as part of your organization and nothing make someone more frustrated and feel less successful than from the beginning, already not having the support and resources that they need. Yeah. And that just creates a litany of problems on an ongoing basis. And you had chatted about this. I know you touched a little bit on culture. So we can certainly circle back to that piece also of having that kind of 30, 60, 90 day plan for that relationship building. So what are some specific tactics you typically include in that? 
Yeah. So the 30, 60, 90 day plan, what I find with salespeople, salespeople are goal oriented people. So they want mm-hmm. to know what they're expected to do. And very often when they're on ramping, you, you put them on OTE. So they don't necessarily have that same goal. So right. you know, the, the first 30 days, it's really about them learning, learning the product, learning the services, learning your processes and learning the people and the culture that they're in. So building out, thinking, thinking through what are they, what are they going to be focused on in this learning time? Who do they, who do they need to, to know really well? And you know, going out into our conversation, even about being in a very remote workforce, I know having been a salesperson myself, my relationship with sales desk, my relationship with legal is so critical. So mm-hmm. building into that 30 day, a chance for them to engage and get to know those people. And also what is it that they have to learn? It's a heavy, heavy learning time for them. Um, and giving them the goals, almost like their exit criteria for what that 30 days is. And also <laughs> exactly. for the sales team, for the sales leader, who's who's probably remote right now or, or, or semi-remote at this point, um, then they know how to engage. Um, then, then, and, and then thinking through the first 90-day RAM period where slowly it, it, it moves from heavy mm-hmm. enablement to more doing their day job. You know, the second, the, 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 from day 30 to day 60 is really kind of where they're going to practice. And they're going to start taking some of the things that you taught them and they're going to maybe have their first customer calls or, or, you know, use the elevated pitch, use their first call deck or whatever it is. So building in that practice for them. And then the, the, the last 60 days or the third 60 to 90 days are, are them really applying it and they're doing more and more of their job, but building in their, you know, some, who are they shadowing and what are they doing and, and, and how are they learning the culture and how are they engaging with the people that they're in? So being very thoughtful of, of, and giving them almost a roadmap of, what they should be accomplishing in those days. And that should be a mix of training sessions, listening on calls, doing things, applying what they're learning um, and, and learning the culture and, and, and the organization at the same time. I love that. It's just such a smart, logical approach that at the end of that, they feel really successful. It really builds on itself. They know what's expected. They know how to access it. And they're able to start hitting those goals, hitting those metrics. You had mentioned earlier about how salespeople don't want to ask questions. I think that gives you a great platform that you can take it on your side and not say, I don't think you know this, but never assume that they know something. And if you realize that that person actually does, you can move a little bit faster, but not brushing over some of those details that are really key to that. Now, in all of that, you keep mentioning culture. That's a huge thing that people tend to overlook because they want someone performing. And especially now it might get a little lost in translation. We had a great conversation about this and I really want to share some of those fun strategies that we came up with. So what are some things rolling around in your mind of how to really make them part of the organization, not just ready to go in their specific job? Yeah. You know, I keep thinking about what are some of the things that you can do under any circumstance, live or remote exactly, um, that can get them to really feel a part of it. So, you know, scavenger hunts are a really fun way of doing it. Right. And the scavenger hunt could be tied into build into the 30, 60, 90, probably in the first 30 and 60, <laughs> but like it could be tied into the learning that they're having. Um, for example, um, if you're teaching about competition, you can have them make, you know, give them a scavenger hunt, um, clue of, you know, go find the rep that sold, you know, that unseated our biggest competitor or something and make it. And that way they're, they're taking their own initiative. They're interacting with their coworkers, but they're also making it a little bit more fun, but then also scavenger hunt on the fun time, right? Like find the, the, the member of the team that that's our, that's a, that's a world-class surfer or whatever. Right. <laughs> and, 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 and have them also have their teammates to try to find out fun things about them. I have a client that or had a client that everyone on the team when they first join gets a Lego set and gets to pick a Lego set and build it and, and, and share it with the I team. love this. Right. <laughs> so, and you know, in, they, you walk into their office and, and it's like a Lego museum, but now like have them have it on their desk at, at home. Right. Or when they come back yeah. to the office, but it's a way and then maybe have them present, like, why did they choose this set or whatever it is for your team? Right. Maybe they make a painting or, or whatever they cook a dish. I don't know. Um, the other thing that I like to is, have them as you, as they get you know more comfortable. Have them share something that they're an expert on, and they're coming mm-hmm. wherever they're coming from, whatever life experience they have, whether it's their first job and they have experience from school, or it, they you know they've been in the workforce for a long time. Have them share something that that they are that they are passionate about or, or an expert about, because it lets everybody else in the team get to know them. Absolutely. I love that. The scavenger hunt was where you and I went on and on because there's so many great ways you can do that, yeah. right? You gave a lot of great suggestions of ways that they're meeting people, but it's also part of the work. 
um, there's a couple of fun things we talked about of where's the, where's the, you know, the good coffee hidden yeah. in the office, yeah. upload a menu of a new lunch spot that you recommend. Where does everyone order food from? Just those little basic things that they're going to feel more comfortable. I love the Lego thing. I know I used to have my team fill out a fun fact survey where kind of mm -hmm. like, you know, those online surveys of what do you order when you go to Starbucks? What's your favorite smoothie? How many siblings do you have? random little facts that they can view about their team. So when they do have those conversations, it doesn't really feel like that awkward first date. That yeah. it's something, they already have something they can start a conversation with, find that commonality. And again, start feeling part of the team, which is just huge, especially right now. I mean, I love your idea of like, what's your favorite coffee? And I, and what, what made, what came up for me when you said that was if yep, you're, yep. if you're not in the <laughs> office, maybe send it to their house, mm -hmm. right? And if you have the budget, send it to them, right? You have think how good they'll feel. Um, make sure you're sending them the swag you would have given out if they were in the office. And mm -hmm. if they are in the office, maybe have that be the team lunch or their favorite meal or they're from their favorite restaurant or something, because you really want them to feel that they're a part of it and they made you know, the right decision um, joining you. And, and it's, and it's tough times. So make them feel like, they're in the right place. Yeah, absolutely. And kind of another way to apply that is I had this great conversation with one of our clients yesterday. Uh, they're looking to utilize Chorus. And if someone uses Chorus or Gong, whatever yeah. your recording software is, of getting them comfortable with that tool and finding a more fun way to train on it. Not just record your thing, go on there, look at the features. But we actually figured out how to turn that into a scavenger hunt mm. where you have this conversation and you're going in and you record a conversation, let's say, you know, you do that Zoom call with your team member and you're talking about your favorite vacation spot. Go back through, where on the transcript was this question asked? How would you clip this here? And just finding those Love fun that. ways that for even things they need to learn how to do, making it more fun and making yeah. them feel less cumbersome. That might help with some of that burnout too, that it's not just dry things that they may love because it's what their job is, but just making it engaging. And I think in general for all enablement today should be fun, right? I, I had a I client <laughs> talking to you yesterday. They were rolling out new pricing and we put in so many fun stuff. And, and, and because again, it's like, it's, it gets dry after a while and it, it, and they may be at home or they're not able to ask you, you want to make sure it's not just about the content. And if you're, if you're, if you ask your company culture, you may not have that kind of a company sure. culture, but if you have a company culture, then show it or whatever your company culture is, make sure it's coming through in and it, I think it goes back to what I said earlier. Remain, remember that you're creating enablement for human beings that are full people. And exactly. this should feel like that. Yeah. And even if you do need to keep it a little bit more on script, obviously we come from organizations that have more of that fun culture. And it's totally cool if that's not your vibe. But there's things that you can do, even kind of going into work ramp for a minute, of having them do challenges and using that aspect of social challenges. So they're able to see other people's submissions. They're able to review other people's submissions, have theirs viewed and reviewed by peers as well, that it still adds that interaction, that social feel, but keeps it a little bit more on book as well. So there's a ton of ways to do that. Yeah. And, and you know what, if you're called, whatever your culture is, make sure that the new person coming on knows what it is, right? If it's, Absolutely. If it's a sign-up culture, then make sure that they're aware that they should be showing up to meetings, you know, with a suit and tie or, 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 or are you yep. relaxing it a little bit more because people are working from home? Like make sure that they know that that's a very important thing that they would normally pick up from being and walking the halls mm -hmm. that they may not get today. Yeah. And you don't want to be the one who feels off in the meeting immediately yeah. and already not part of the culture. Yeah. Uh, we had a question pop up that, Brianna, I actually have a clarifying for you. So the question says, do we have examples of what they did for fun when dropping pricing or packaging? I'm interpreting that as ways of fun ways to train people to talk about pricing and packaging. So I'm going to start down that path. And if that wasn't your question, please drop a clarifying in there. We'd be happy to explain. Yes, that was her question. Okay, great. Thank you. Roz, jump in, go for it. Yeah, so first of all, they, they let their personality show through. That you, Pricing could be a very dry topic to train mm -hmm. on, and they let their personality um, 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 show through. They, they showed up very human. And in their application, they made the scenarios fun scenarios. They made the stories fun stories. The customers were fun. The things that the way they were having to present it was fun to who they were presenting it to. Um, and they, they almost created this like journey of, yes, they were teaching them how to, how to sell, how to change the price. They were changing, overall changing pricing of the, of the product. 
but they used it in a, in a fun way that the reps got a chuckle out of it. And, and pricing is a good example because pricing, changing pricing is very, very scary for salespeople, mm-hmm. especially in difficult times. So yeah. being able to um, make it a fun scenario for them that they were able to kind of relax a little bit, but also get the practice. Right. Um, and they also were like, they, they had done it in micro, like little short um, videos and, and they would, they would acknowledge, all right, so video 30 of 87,000, right? Like, and, and, and it really wasn't, but like, you know, or we're getting just to the call it out. Your kids, right? Like yeah. just being humans themselves and, and kind of like opening up the, the hood on that a, 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 a little bit, but also trying to put humor and story into the scenarios that they were teaching. At the end of the day, they learned how to, how to, how to adjust the pricing. Yeah. Absolutely. That's a great question. And Brianna, hopefully that gives you a little bit more insight there. I had some questions, uh, some thoughts there that are way, way into the fun realm that probably don't suit a lot of salespeople. So um, I worked for a kid's organization for a very long time. So getting quirky and uncomfortable is certainly what we would do. One that, that they didn't do, but we could, we could have done is like, you know, you, you usually cover objection handling and pricing or objection mm-hmm. handling and anything. Throw right. a couple of like really ridiculous out there objections. Right. Yeah. And then, and then almost the regular <clears throat> objections don't see as, seem as bad. Right. Right. Um, so, you know, doing things like that, think outside the box, be as, be as creative as you can. Yeah. Today. It's always that fear, right? It's that fear of being told no or being called out. So I used to, and I've done this with a bunch of my clients and speaking engagements and things of kind of calling that fear right out. And I'd pick a guinea pig, someone that I thought could handle it and have them share the objection with me and just really aggressively get really angry about it and be like, no, that's an awful answer. And then they're like, what? Like no customer's ever going to do that. You've experienced it. You've survived it take a breath and let's get into what this is actually going to be like. And it kind of just takes the wall down a little bit and gets a little bit more comfortable with it. Yeah. Great questions. So keeping all of these things in mind, and we touched a lot on making it fun, that 30, 60, 90 plan. Any other, I think we've touched on this a little bit, but since the question came up, I'll, if there's any other thoughts that come to mind of any other tips for moving onboarding boot camps online. I think, I mean, I'll go back to, you know, the, the term I used earlier is flip the classroom. The, think about how they can learn the information without just having to be talked at. Um, is there something, is there pre-work that they can read and do or watch before and then bring them together for, um, for the actual discussion? Or can they actually, can you put them, can you find somebody on the team that they can work through to be able to um, learn about the competition, about the pricing, whatever it is. Think of all these different creative ways rather than just talking at them. Um, and, and I think also like break up their, um, their time in you know, learning and doing, let them do a little bit too. And don't expect them to just sit in front of a computer screen for, for 10 hours a day. It's not humanly possible and they won't retain a thing. So you know, you, if you used to do a week boot camp, it may be a two week boot camp, but half days. Right. right. So think about that. It, it, a, a full day of live training does not translate to a full day of, of, of online learning. Um, and, <laughs> Absolutely. Are, and think blended, think blended and, and chunk down and accurate or up to date, I should say. Yeah. Absolutely. Those are great questions. So hopefully a bunch of people ask that in different ways. Hopefully that addresses that. So thank you for keeping the questions coming. And last so, thing I'll say on that because yep, I think it's important, um, tell the new hires that things are changing because they don't know things are changing. The existing people thinks that things, right. knows that things are changing and the existing people know that, that knows that things are dynamic. So you might want to tell, tell the new hire, you know, this is, this, this is what we know is true as of today. It may change tomorrow. Please bear with us. Absolutely. That transparency will take you everywhere for sure. Yeah. So then bringing all of this and kind of, you know, bringing it home, pulling into our last topic here of really just staying nimble with this. So how can businesses stay competitive and nimble with that ongoing training? We talked about the accuracy of things, but you had talked a lot about when we chatted being really specific and there's some skills that are maybe more relevant now than were previously. So can you just talk to that a little bit more? Yeah. So, you know, sales is different today and it will be different for the next little while and it could still continue to change. So a few things that we see, first of all, there are some companies that are, that are doing really, 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 they have a higher, higher demand because of what we're going through and let those people just sell, just let them do what they do. Um, And then for others, it, it, every deal is so much more um, important, if you will. So 
what we're seeing, first of all, is executives are getting, uh, executives on the buyer side are getting on calls at a lot earlier, right? So make sure that the rep is comfortable to be able to have that executive conversation because what you say to an executive is different than what you're going to say to maybe the right. practitioner who's going to use your product. Um, you have to justify the ROI. So make sure that they have a good ROI calculator that, that you know, uh, see finance people think in, in numbers, not in PowerPoints or giving them the resource in a way that they can actually uh, have a, a, that conversation. They, they know what they're, what that stakeholder actually really cares about. Um, and sell the value of, of how, what your solution is is going to do to help them today because it, today is very different than it was six months ago and it's very different than it might be in a year from now so really making sure that they have the skills to be able to sell in the new world there's you know i sold in 2010 i sold in in, in the during the, the 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 downturn and i think what i learned in that time frame is really be thoughtful about how you're solving a problem for the buyer and, mm -hmm. and take advantage and, and reinforce those skills. And if your business is a little slower right now, practice that, give mm -hmm. them an opportunity. You know, one of the thoughts that I have too is like, um, you know, if, if there, if there's not as much business, then have them and you want them to practice a skill like selling to executives, selling to CFO, practice it on a, even, a, even on what we'll call a B or C opportunity, practice it on a B or C opportunity because then they will be better when it is that A opportunity, right? right. Um, because you have that luxury right now to do it. So be be thoughtful and, and watch, listen to the gongs or the choruses or your call intelligence. Mm -hmm. like, what is coming up? What are the questions that the buyer is having? Who are they actually talking to? Listen to that intelligence um, and, and make sure that your messaging is on point for that. Yeah, absolutely. It's exactly like you're saying, taking the time now. And if you're not the solution that is really enabling the remote world right now, at least find the opportunity to build your credibility, right? People you're recognizing, they're not going to buy from me right now, but you can be that resource. You can be the person that's the authority in the field that's there to support them. You're not trying to sell them at every opportunity. So when they are prepared, you're top of mind because you actually added value. You didn't just keep pushing a product that they don't need or just genuinely don't have the ability to invest in right now. Yeah. So a couple of ways that we kind of chatted through this that I think is really impactful for those of you who are joining us today is how in doing all these, we've talked about a lot of great strategies of how to share information, how to make it fun, how to keep that culture, how to be relevant and transparent. But what are some ways to keep a pulse on the sales reps and on the teams, really know when they're struggling and just make sure we're getting that adoption that we need? First of all, ask them. They have opinions <laughs> there, they Certainly. Are, right? Like salespeople are typically not shy or mm -hmm. right. And they will tell you what they want to be heard and they want to feel like you are listening to them. So ask them, what do you need? What are the, what are the skills that you need to develop now that you might not have needed six months ago? Or what are the skills that you want to be able to, or resources that you need? Um, and also ask them, why do you need it? Not because you're questioning them, but like, what are you trying to do? What are you trying right, to do? What's your outcome? So that I can make sure that I'm, that I'm giving you, you know, the, what you really need. And then it doesn't mean you have to respond to every person in, um, offline, uh, you know, one-offs, but you'll start mm -hmm. seeing a trend, right? You'll start seeing this is what all the people need. So, so ask them, listen to them, um, and, and be real with them and letting, making sure that they understand that you want, that they know, you know, the reality of their world right now. Right. I think that that's really important. So ask them, um, and listen to them and then listen to, listen to the signals from, what's coming through the Slack chats, what's, what's, what are they look, which documents are they looking at? If you have visibility into your knowledge management or your asset management, which courses are they, are they taking right. um, over and over again? Like really, um, and then, you know, the sales manager, you know, listen, listen to your partners, ask the sales managers and say the frontline sales managers, what are you hearing? What, what are they, what are they discussing? What are the questions that you're having? And also kind of going back to our, 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 our new hires, new hires are going to ask questions that existing custom, that existing reps don't ask you. And that might be, they, they, the existing reps might have that question too. Right. Make sure that, they, that you're putting two and two together. Absolutely. And kind of along those same veins, you and I talked about how to communicate this and maybe being two New Yorkers, we have a good vibe on this, but of really not BSing your team. So what did you mean by that? Yeah. Well, you should never BS salespeople, but certainly don't do it right now. <laughs> when you BS salespeople, they roll their eyes and they, everything you say after that is, is completely um, discounted. And so letting them know you understand the reality of their lives, 
whether or not you've ever been a salesperson and that you're, and just be real and transparent with them and don't try to make, don't try to sugarcoat things. Don't try to things make things sound you mm-hmm. know, easier or better than they are because the reality is it's really, really hard out there right now. Right. Um, and, but it doesn't mean that it's undoable and it doesn't mean that we don't have, that we can't come up with a resource and they will show up and partner with you and maybe even ask them, how do you think we should, we should approach this? They're smart yep. people. I, you have to assume you hired smaller people, let them be a partner with you. Um, and, and, you know, you kind of we're taking a full circle to, you know, we keep saying, listen to what they have to say, but you're also running on, on less resources right now. So even if saying, you know, I really hear you, I know you really need that. We're so strapped right now. What's the most important thing you need? Right. Or how, really can we prioritizing. Make you, how can we make use of the stuff we have, even if it's not perfect, but try to solve the problems with them rather than, than assuming that you have all the answers or them assuming that you don't really understand it. Yeah. Um, and then just have empathy for them, right? And for their buyers, because it's, it's everybody's kind of going through a lot right now. And we have Absolutely. a shared experience. I think that's one thing we all have in common right now. And, and it's one thing that, that I have noticed in, in, in listening to, to some calls and people are asking how people are and they're really meaning it. It's not just a question that they're asking. So, so do that, you know, have that relationship back with them. Yeah. I love that. And one of the biggest things that's changing, I'm sure for a lot of people, is that previously we've had the ability to even have that in-person connection with our clients, do those on-site meetings, do the traveling. How can we bridge that gap with everything going on right now? Yeah. You know, if you, and if you, if you um, enable a team that's used to being in the field, make sure that they know how to sell remotely um, and make sure that they know how to build connection. And that might be the skills that you, that you develop. Um, one of the things that I think about, one of my favorite presentation styles is this Petra Kutcher presentation, which is like a 20 by 20 presentation. Um, and, and the whole idea of it is that you, you, in six minutes and 40 seconds, you tell the person exactly what they need in a very engaging way. Maybe teach them that, right? Maybe yeah. that's, or, and you know what, experiment, try new things, have them try things, and then look to see where, you know, where are we seeing success, where are we not, and let them give it back to you. Um, you know, one of the things I see a lot of uh, field sales reps doing is turning their Zoom backgrounds into their decks that they would have normally presented, right? And so it, it allows them to be engaging and, and without having to be using a PowerPoint, but using their Zoom backgrounds as their deck. Yeah. Right? To try to be thinking about That's what are the resources, right? Which I think is yeah. a very creative way of doing it. And so it gave this big room feel when instead of like having like this, this little uh, PowerPoint right. um, on, the, on the screen um, and teach them how to... Um, yeah, another thing that we're, you're seeing in, in calls is like um, the small talk that would normally happen in, in, in person, maybe in the waiting room. How do you make sure that they do that, but not too much of it um, so that you build that connection because people buy from people, right? And right. how we give, how we are building that connection without being able to, uh, to be there in person. Maybe send something to the person you're presenting to so that they have something physical, if you have a budget for that, mm-hmm. that they have something physical from you, from you there and then say, you know, I wish I could be there in person. I would have given this to you. So now, you know, you know we're, we're doing it remotely. Um, so, so really try to be thinking about making sure that they know how to do it because if they're on, the, the, thing, the challenge with sales is if I'm uncomfortable, the buyer picks up on it, right? So anything mm-hmm. I can do to make these, these reps who are used to selling in one way very comfortable um, is really important. Yeah, absolutely. And I was going right down that same path as you said about sending something to them because that's a lot of what you do, right? To kind of break that ice in the beginning, kind of similar to how we said, send, you know, their favorite coffee drink to your new team member, find out what's relevant to them, do a little Intel, get some, do some digging, get that Intel and just make it that much more personal that shows you put the time and effort in that maybe, you know, the 30 minutes you would spend driving there, you spend doing this research and placing this order. So helping them see it's time you would have used anyway here's what that result is going to be. And then when doors do open again, being really mindful, like you said, of maybe your team members aren't comfortable. Maybe they don't want you coming to their office when they have to go back. And how do we navigate that? Yeah. And, you know, make sure that we at where, you know, if, we, if let's say we, I don't, we go back to a, a field, the field going out in person, each, each buyer might be different, right? So, exactly. so make sure that the sales team knows to ask, what are you comfortable with? And what are you going to expect from me? Do I have to wear a mask? I'm not going to have to have my, my, right my temperature taken and you, you know, and, and, and are you as a, as a, as a salesperson comfortable with that mm-hmm. too, right? So being able to have uh, that communication and making that okay. And maybe even having guidelines, like these are our company guidelines. And part of the guidelines is asking the buyer what their guidelines are. Maybe we're going to meet in a, in a park, right? So it's outside and it's open and we do it exactly. Quickly, right. And, and yeah. so, and, and, and what are some ways that will make you feel comfortable and make the buyer feel comfortable um, in this ever changing you know, world that we live in? And then you know what, if you wake up and you're not feeling well, don't go. Yeah. 
and ask the be buyer to tell you if they're not going to be feeling well. Exactly. Right? <laughs> it's just another way to be human with everything going on yeah. right now and really showing that you care about them and you're not pushing them to do something just because you want to get a sale. Yeah, and It's just exactly. a great way to really build that relationship. So um, these are some great points. I really appreciate hearing all of these thoughts from you. You had a lot of great ideas, really tangible, a lot of things to think about. I haven't seen any new questions pop up. So any final thoughts or things that you want to leave as parting wisdom for <laughs> our friends out there in the world today? Yeah, I'm going to go back to sales enablement is so critical right now. And what you are putting out for your teams is, is more important than ever. It was important, but it's more important than ever. Right. Because, and you have to remember that and remind the people you're working with of that. Um, you're the, the, the type of enablement that you put out is going to make or break the salesperson being able to connect with their buyer, mm -hmm. being able to get, to, to keep the, the, the company, um, um, functioning as best as possible. And whether it's today or whether the buyer remembers how good they were and comes back, um, know your value that you're bringing mm -hmm. because you're probably an unsung hero right now. And, um, and, and just be thoughtful and try things, experiment. If it's not perfect, you'll learn from it. And, Absolutely. Um, you know, fail forward with everybody else because there's this is there's real no play. There really is no playbook to this. So we're creating the playbook as we go, and so be creative about it um, and be on purpose. At the same fail time. forward. I love that. That's a perfect way to kind of wrap it up and really just be in the trenches and all of this together. So, Roz, thank you again for your time. This was great. I hope all of you on the line got some great tactics here. Got some great information. Other questions come up. Feel free to ping us. We will certainly circle back with some answers for you. We love brainstorming with all of you guys. So thank you again for taking the time. Everyone stay safe, stay healthy. And uh, to kind of wrap it up with the theme that came up routinely, be human. Have a good one. Thanks again, everyone. Bye all.